Every business wants to unleash the value of data in order to increase agility, drive innovation, and improve efficiency. While data is abundant and growing rapidly, just producing or storing it doesn't automatically create value. Value is realized by creating a culture and an operating model to put that data to use every day to invent on behalf of your customers using actioned insights, analytics, and AI ML. However, cultural challenges, outdated governance models, organizational silos, and legacy execution approaches stand in the way of realizing this vision. In this session, we'll talk about why being data-driven matters. We will cover some of the strategies that we see customers using to overcome the barriers to becoming data-driven. And I am delighted to be joined by Andy White from Sportsbet, who will bring to life the journey that Sportsbet is on, talk about their strategy, key initiatives, and some lessons learned. The imperative to become data-driven is different for every organization. And I would encourage you to think about why it matters for your business. Your organization is unique. It has unique challenges, a unique business strategy, a unique culture, and unique opportunities to garner better value from the wealth of data that it sits upon. A few common reasons we see here are, speed in business matters, and speed in business decision-making matters. Toyota Racing uses images from the track, even when the car is over two kilometers away, to make a decision as to whether to make a pit stop or not. They use machine learning to simulate various race scenarios, helping them to compete better. Responding better to the unexpected. And this is a common thing that we've all seen in the last couple of years. Moderna uses data and ML not only to accelerate vaccine development, but also to scale manufacturing capacity to meet demand. Locally, Ticketek uses data and personalization to provide relevant targeted offers to their customers and deliver better customer experiences. Ticketek's data science, engineering, and marketing teams worked alongside AWS to design, build, and launch the solution in less than four weeks. The platform serves personalized event recommendations to Ticketek's 16 million customer base and analyzes 32 million data points across thousands of events in a matter of hours. As a result, Ticketek has seen an immediate uplift in traffic and conversions from the newsletter, which will continue to rise as the engine evolves and learns in the coming months. Uncovering new opportunities. Disney Plus Streaming used data and ML to seamlessly expand to over 50 countries since launch with compelling content that is relevant to the customer no matter where they are in the world. Data also allows Amazon.com to drive efficiency by finding opportunities to automate and eliminate waste. For example, since 2015, using data insights and machine learning, Amazon.com has reduced the outbound packaging size by 33%, resulting in eliminating over 900,000 tons of packaging. Machine learning identifies products and recommends the appropriate packaging. This not only improves efficiency, but also goes a long way to supporting our sustainability commitments. Let's look at a brief history of how enterprises use data. What we see is the progression from being data aware to becoming data informed and finally data driven. There is a lot of information on this slide, but I like to think about this as the progression from being data is no one's job to data is someone's job to data is everyone's job. In the early days, organizations focused on static data. There were static batch reports that took a long time to run, used primarily by executives or department heads to look back and answer the question, what happened? Then enterprises started to gain insights with interactive dashboards. The data was available to more power users or functional experts across the enterprise as they tried to answer the question, why did it happen? However, the data was still siloed between different systems and departments, making this hard. A data-driven enterprise today can use data to guide actions in every aspect of their business. Data can not only inform, but with data science, it can be turned into automated actions to improve the business while being made available to everyone. At the heart of any data-driven organization is the internal culture of the business with respect to the way they view and act upon data. Every organization I speak with is intent on driving more value from data, and many are improving incrementally, but few feel they've really realized the vision of becoming truly data-driven. And so why is this the case? 
Becoming data-driven requires time, focus, investment and commitment. In working with thousands of enterprises, we've been able to focus on four key pillars, each with their own guiding principles that help an organisation successfully become data-driven. As is true with many topics we discuss, the first pillar is often culture. A strong culture establishes the beliefs and behaviours that all other aspects are built upon. Without a strong culture, you will struggle. A good principle here is to focus on facts and not feelings. This reminds me of the Edward Deming quote, in God we trust, all others bring facts. But that is not enough. We need to build a culture that empowers people to act upon those facts. When it comes to a data-driven culture, you need more than just executive sponsorship. Leaders have to visibly engage in how they share data, make decisions and help break down barriers. You will need to enable frontline action using data. Data democratisation is not just about enabling access to data, but rather enabling actions using that data, what I would call decision democratisation. Finally, treating data proficiency as a core skill for the whole company and investing as such, not just in selective data literacy programs. I don't believe there is a single organisational structure that defines a data-driven organisation. As I said earlier, your organisation is unique and your structure and people are unique. So think about organisational structures that will support your goals. Align, align around outcomes and not activities. Operate with a you build it, you run it mentality. Embrace the idea of autonomous cross-functional teams. At Amazon, we love good mechanisms and that's for a good reason. Think of a mechanism like a process. Mechanisms help to convert good intentions, like we want to become data-driven, into measurable outcomes across the whole enterprise. So there are three things I'd like you to think about. Number one, measurement. As the popular saying goes, what gets measured gets done. But is it really that simple? Don't measure everything. Not everything that can be counted counts. For a data-driven organisation, measurements should be used to experiment, assess and course correct not as a fixed achievement of targets. Number two is governance. Set up the right governance that enables safe, compliant and easy access to data. Done right, a good governance model can accelerate your journey to becoming data driven. But if you're not careful, it can become one of the biggest roadblocks that impedes progress. And finally, data quality. Something that is often forgotten until you start using the data. Garbage in, garbage out. And this has to start at the source. Incentivize better quality in your source systems. This can be done by building quality checks for automated data and educating producers of data on the downstream impact and the use of high quality data. But I would also encourage you to be pragmatic about data quality. There is a tension between quality and speed and knowing where this sits for your organization or use case is important. And finally, a strategy without execution is hallucination. Start business backwards, not data forwards. Start small with multiple iterations and be nimble. Show business value early and keep your business stakeholders aligned and excited. Now, I have just covered a lot of information, but I believe the best way to bring these approaches to life is through a customer story. I would like to introduce Andy White, who heads up Data at Sportsbet, to talk about what being data-driven means for them, the initiatives that they're running with, and some of the lessons learned to date. Hey guys, I'm Andy White, Head of Data for Sportsbet. Now before we get started, I just want to provide some quick stats about our company to give you some context. Sportsbet are the number one Aussie bookmaker, with a 42% market share. And we process a ridiculous amount of data, with 4 billion price changes across 24 million markets in the last year alone. Demand on our platforms also fluctuates pretty wildly. We need to support 3 to 4,000 bets a minute on an average weekday and then scale up to handle over 65,000 bets per minute during the Melbourne Cup. We're known for our product innovation, our personalised generosity and our industry leading approach to responsible gambling, much of which is driven by machine learning with over 20 models currently in production. Over the last 18 months or so, we've made some great strides in becoming data driven. We've rolled out company wide education initiatives we drastically increased our data science, engineering and analytics capability and we're taking on an ambitious data modernisation program. Being a digital business, data has always been a focus of sports bet. But over the last few years, it has become a top priority as our speed and scale reach new heights. 
Some of the factors pushing towards becoming more data-driven include doubling our market share over the last five years, with this increasing volume putting strain on our existing systems and processes. Our customers have always been our priority, and increasingly we are looking for data to help us bring more excitement to life through personalised and context-driven experiences. We're also adding more and more complex products to our offering, with same game, same race multis, and most recently bets with mates. This complexity carries more risk in pricing and greater swings in liabilities, and data quality is now a chief concern. The industry itself is also moving at pace, with the introduction and consolidation of brands happening quite regularly. In our case, the integration of BetEasy in 2020. We need our core platforms to be more agile and future ready to support these changes. Regulation in this space is also growing, and the auditability of decisions is increasingly important as the industry, governments and our partners increase controls. All these factors coupled with the strategy and ambitions led us to the realisation back in 2020 that even though our current approach was working, we wouldn't be able to support the business in the medium to long term. So we did a piece of work early on to understand our current state data maturity a little bit better and identify what changes needed to deliver our target state. So looking at where we were back in 2020, our maturity at this stage was still very much focused on human-driven and reactive analytics. And while there were pockets of more advanced ML models, this was far from standard practice. We have been attempting to drive the adoption of ML and automated decisioning through localised initiatives for a few years at this point, which have been successful in their own right, but the business priorities and capacity challenges had limited our ability to roll this out at scale. Our target state of democratised data, real-time analytics and ubiquitous ML was not getting any closer. The Timo Elliott model we were using to articulate the step change refers to this gap in capability from moving from human-driven to automated analytics as the chasm. And crossing this chasm needs to be driven by a clear strategy, focused investment and broad organisational support. With this in mind, we kick-started what I like to call the sports bet data renaissance. So looking back, I think future goals will break the sports bet data renaissance up into three broad periods. The early movers were the foundational pieces, which introduced and proved out some core technology in sports bet. And you could argue they were focused mainly on buzzwords, data lake, single customer view, personalization. And while they did deliver business value and demonstrate the potential for the data, they were not sustainable. The initiatives were not supported by a broader change program. We didn't look to uplift the skills outside of the project, delivery teams, or most importantly, we didn't have a defined and prioritized roadmap for the future development of these capabilities. But one of our great company values is reflect, learn, and improve. And the learnings from these projects we use as inputs into developing our longer term data strategy and target state architectures. Following this, we have the Renaissance Catalyst. So at this stage, some of our existing data stacks were starting to hinder our growth with capacity and performance challenges. We had ambitious and driven business stakeholders and a much better understanding of some of the key technologies and patterns that could assist. But the chasm still loomed ahead. To determine how we're going to answer these problems, we set out in defining a strategy to deliver our vision for data at Sportsbet. In this work, we understood the current pain points and future ambitions of our stakeholders. We identified overlaps and gaps in our technology stacks, and we reviewed our core processes for bottlenecks, redundancy and missed opportunities. All of which led to what was in the end quite a simple and concise strategy deck that we could use to garner support from across the business. And these ideas and themes then fed into broader strategies and drove investment and prioritisation into the space. And so strategy in hand, support enlisted, the renaissance begun in that pace. At its heart, our strategy was deceptively simple with three key themes. Enabling our people, uplifting our platforms and strengthening our processes. But these core themes abstracted a lot of complexity in the outcomes that they were driving. To enable our people, we had to obtain investment to increase our team's capacity, identify strategic skill sets and roll out training programs across a thousand people, increase the understanding of machine learning and build trust in its output, and define and embed KPIs into our business. To uplift our platforms, we had to re-architect our stacks on the ground up, focusing on cloud native technologies and building in flexibility to respond to unknown requirements introduce new patterns and technologies to support streaming analytics and real-time automated decisioning, embed data quality into all stages of our pipelines, and radically simplify our environment and decommission legacy stacks. To strengthen our processes, 
We had to deliver cultural change across the company and accept business ownership of data. We need to provide capabilities and guardrails for people to self-serve their own reporting and analytics and obtain business sponsorship to include exposing key data sets in project scope and breaking down silos of information. And that's still sugarcoating it. As a result, this is not a short-term play. We are 18 months in and many of these initiatives are still in progress or yet to be kicked off. But after all, the Sistine Chapel wasn't painted in a day. This is our masterpiece, the technical product of the data renaissance which leverages a lake house pattern and is intended to replace four existing stacks into a single platform for our future use cases. Some key points are different to our previous approach include sourcing streaming data sets from Kafka to reduce data latency into the platform, automated reconciliation to improve the quality and availability of data for decisioning, definitions, lineage, availability and other key metadata being exposed in a business catalogue using Amundsen to support self-service simplifying and centralising our security model to democratise and protect our data more effectively. Adopting an infinitely scalable storage on S3, utilising Databricks Delta and Redshift as an access layer to provide flexibility between cost and performance. Building out a future-ready compute layer to allow the dynamic scaling and processing and reduce the impact of race days and other key events on our SLAs. This is currently leveraging AMR, that is able to be extended to utilise other types of compute as the landscape evolves radically simplifying our environment by adopting a single platform for all analytics and decommissioning our legacy stacks. Building out a streaming analytics framework based upon Kinesis Data Analytics and Flink to expose key metrics in near real time for use in data models and dashboards. And exposing data sets via APIs and low latency caches like feature stores or ML ops and real time decisioning. Becoming truly data driven is something that we are still moving towards, but there have been some really positive outcomes early doors. From a maturity curve perspective, we have achieved a 50% uplift in our position 18 months ago, crossing the chasm and embedding the importance of data within Sportsbet. We've been powering this work through our org design, appointing and elevating key positions and bringing in more than 50 new data roles into the company. Our Data Academy has been a big success, with strong involvement from all parts of Sportsbet. We've even managed to poach some people from the business into data science and engineering roles on the back of the program. Data modernisation is a long-term initiative but we now have the MVP of our target state up and running with production use cases, realising some significant gains in performance and data quality with our first legacy stack scheduled for DCOM later this year. Data governance is making its mark, with LT endorsed framework now in place and key business data owners and stewards appointed. This has been a huge support in setting up our new platform and gaining confidence in the data that we're migrating across. So 18 months in, it is only fair that we have a few battle scars and learnings to share. Organisational support is crucial, and not just from the top down. This program isn't a quick fix, and in most cases it's a multi-year journey. You definitely need a strong C-level sponsor to maintain priority and investment over this time, but you also need to win the hearts and minds of your broader stakeholders and tech teams, and ensure that they can buy into the value on offer and support the required cultural changes. Communication is key, and over-communication is even better. You need to discuss and showcase scope, initiatives, outcomes and progress at every opportunity, this removes any ambiguity and builds up a common language across teams, ensuring the focus remains on the business value. Embedding headline metrics into transparent scorecards is a great way to maintain this conversation. Aligning the work to use cases. There can often be a healthy distrust for tech-led initiatives within the business, and the trust me, I'll be back in 18 months approach rarely works. So breaking down the strategy into functional capabilities and finding a champion use case and a sponsor for each one can help improve culture, the tech and the process incrementally and gain momentum and support throughout through demonstrating value along the way. You really need to finish what you start. Tech transformations can be really messy and prolonged and things can get, only get worse before they get better. You need commitment to see it through to a logical breakpoint or things can end up in a worse state with new styles of data or processes split or duplicated across multiple platforms. Your partners are your best friends. Vendors want you to succeed with their technology and there's lots of support on offer if you bring them along for the journey. AWS has been a great supporter of our work in this space, running data labs and hacks to prove out capability and instill best practice within the teams, providing funding via their MAP program to reduce the cost involved in migrations and parallel runs, making SMEs available to work with our delivery teams and help workshop issues, and capturing and prioritising requirements in future product backlogs. 
It's also really key to ensure you have visibility of vendor roadmaps to prevent building soon to be released features yourself. Educate as you go. Aspects such as data latency, data quality and governance can often be intangible to people outside of data. You need to showcase and demonstrate these core principles as they are touched and build up the literacy of your stakeholders. Creating capacity early on is really important and you can invest in quick wins or initiatives that free up your team and provide you with momentum later in the project. Consider what legacy items can be decommissioned early. What processes can be automated? How can you enable greater self-service? And unfortunately, it's never over. This is not a project with an end date. You need continual investment to involve with the business and technology. Standing still in this space is falling behind. And now, I'll pass you back to Vicky. To summarise, here are the guiding principles or pillars across culture, organisation, mechanisms and execution that we covered earlier. And although we sometimes use different terminology, Andy has touched on some of the initiatives that they've doubled down on to move the needle on their journey to becoming data-driven. Things like data literacy and culture via the skills program, governance, building data quality in at the source, and starting small and showing business value early. The key takeaway here is that becoming data-driven is not about building a platform or even executing in just one of these areas. There are a number of levers that you need to pull and over-indexing on just one like governance or platform build won't necessarily see the results that you're expecting. This does not mean that you need to execute on all of them at once. This is a journey. Think about the levers that you need to pull at the right moment in time based on the stage of your organization's journey. The journey to becoming a data-driven enterprise is really exciting and fun. Remember what I said at the start, it takes time, focus, investment and commitment. But you don't have to do it all alone. We have a number of programs and solutions that can support that journey, helping you to create the vision, focusing on people and culture, and the implementation of new operating models. I'd like to double down on three of these programs. Do you need help building a data vision and strategy? The AWS Data Driven Everything program partners with stakeholders across the business and technology to create an organizational vision for innovation with data in order to drive business outcomes and mobilize around a specific use case. Create a pilot and then scale that pilot into production with robust security, operations and a well-defined organizational strategy. The Skills Guild program helps to foster excitement and build momentum to move your organization towards data literacy. And Andy said this well, bringing the whole company on the journey. Do you have an existing strategy but need help executing it? Consider the AWS Data Lab. AWS Data Lab offers accelerated joint engineering engagements between customers and AWS technical resources to create tangible deliverables that accelerate data and analytics modernization initiatives. I am very proud to be part of this program that brings to life real use cases in accelerated timeframes. And this is an initiative that Sportsbet have leveraged multiple times with tremendous value. So to continue your cloud journey, please have a look at some of these training resources. And finally, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And a big thank you to Andy and the team at Sportsbet who have so openly and very humbly shared their journey. At Amazon, we try hard to be a data-driven organization. So your feedback is immensely valuable. Please take the time to complete the session survey.